usual, we start with a collect from the 10th Sunday after Trinity for this particular week. Let thy merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your servants, and that they may obtain their desires and petitions, cause, make, compel, move them to ask those things that are good and pleasing in your most holy and infinite sight through the merits, might, and mediation of our sovereign Redeemer, Jesus. Amen. Uh, we continue our work with the Episcopal Hymnal, verse 4 of hymn 668, a paraphrase on Psalm 121 from the 1650 um, Scottish Psalter. Um, from evil he shall keep thee safe, and shall thy strength restore and guide thy going out and in, both now and evermore. Well, we continue our work here with to listen to an old school Princetonian scholar um, from Princeton, Robert Dick Wilson, who spent his life studying oh, umpteen number of languages, all the Semitic languages, as well as the various European languages in which the Old Testament was and New Testament was given. Spent the next 15 years of his life applying those findings to his teaching and the last 15 years of his illustrious and prodigious life applying those, right, that, those language studies to scriptures and it's just such a delight to hear someone else you're not listening to many although i'm reading it we interject here and there but the focus is on this voice from the past robert dick wilson professor robert dick wilson of semitic languages and old testament studies at princeton we have a short volume here called the scientific investigation of the old testament shorts only 232 pages, and we'd like to, but don't have it at hand, where in his uh, studies this document was produced, but that will just have to remain an open question for now. Let's skip, let's let the professor, though dead, speak anew and afresh. He's talking about the laws in the Pentateuch, that is Genesis through Deuteronomy, um, to which we say in our church services, this is the word of the Lord. I got to look at the lectionary and see what they cut out from it. Um, anyways, Professor Wilson, with regard to the remaining portions of the Pentateuch, there's a strong presumption that they are the work of Moses. We find that the collection of laws, however great or small these collections may be, and whatever their subject matter are in the E document attributed invariably to Moses. Let me interject. Uh, we're studying Egyptian history, Mesopotamian history, archaeology, and we're finding law codes in all these ancient cultures in the third millennium BC. So we're not in the least bit surprised to see Moses reared in the scribal school in Egypt, being familiar with law, which shows that he was a lawyer, so to speak, not in the American sense, but in the old Semitic sense. So we're not at all so surprised by the book of Leviticus or the Code of the Covenant, the so-called Code of the Covenant, 19 through 34, says in the prologue that Moses went up unto God in Mount Sinai and the Lord said to him, quote, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. 19 verses 2 through 6. So, quote, Moses went down unto the people and spake to them. 1925. The words of chapter 20 and the judgments of 21 through 28. And he asks us here a footnote to compare Bentley's great argument against the genuineness of the epistles of Phalaris in his dissertations upon the epistles of Phalaris. 
Then in chapter 34, we're told that Moses told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, verse 3. And that Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and afterwards read the book of the covenant in the audience of the people and said, all that the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. And it, I'll interject here. It's this scribe's view that Moses had a scriptorium in his travels. Because there was such a close approximation in Egyptian religion between politics and theology. The Pharaoh was viewed as the vice regent of God on earth, much like the medieval papal view. The same is true over in the Persian arena. <clears throat> and so to grow up in Pharaoh's house was to grow up among the scribes trying to record history and make things permanent. In like manner, back to the professor, let the prof speak here. In like manner, the book of Deuteronomy is again an ascribed to Moses. Thus it begins. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on the banks of Jordan, in the wilderness of Arabah, in the land of Moab, 1-5. Again, in the epilogue in 29.1, it is said, these are the words of the covenant, which the Lord commanded Moses. It's a nice word there. Didn't ask, didn't suggest. Actually, the position of authority, the infinite God over the little tiny guy, but important guy, Moses. And if we could just keep that perspective, Old Testament, New Testament, systematics, church history, practical theology, and contemporary theology. And our systematics helps to keep a lot of things before us as we go back into these Old Testament studies and I'm perfectly confident that uh, Prof. Wilson would agree with question, in fact, I know he would question and answer four of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, who is God? This is what we teach children. Answer, God is a spirit infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Yes, we teach 10, 12-year-olds that. So it's very important that we have the right understanding of God in relation to Moses as being his total and absolute sovereign. Uh, there's a lot of choking on that these days. Uh, or they try to make God in a wax nose, make him into how they like him to be. In P also, now he's engaging the documentary hypothesis here. Um, also, the larger portion and in individual laws claim Moses as the author. I think he's trying to defang the documentary hypothesis by showing that Moses was in each of these alleged four documents that the documentarians and Graffel Hausians proposed and then dogmatized uh, what he called the inquisitors against the text earlier. Thus the offering for the tabernacle and its plan were commanded by God to the people through Moses. Exodus 25, 1 and 9 29, 42, and 43. So also with the laws of the offering, Leviticus 1.1, 1, 1. the consecration of the priests, Leviticus 8, unclean food, Leviticus 9. Of leprosy, Leviticus 12, 14. And in short, all the other laws of the Pentateuch. That's what he's doing. He's defanging uh, the dogmatic assertion of the inquisitors. That's what he calls them. And I'm not far behind him in saying that myself. I think it's a very leading and telling description of fellows like Eichhorn. Now, with regard to anyone in particular of these codes and laws, we do not see how any living man can have the assurance, the assumption of an impossible knowledge, to assert that it may not have been, as it claims to be, the work of Moses. Wow. That's polite academies for a slam dunk. Language, subject matter, and circumstances all favor the claim of each particular section to have been what it professes to be. 
is only by resorting to what we deem an unjustifiable method of procedure that any case can be made out on behalf of the deniers of mosaic authorship. This method is based on the presumption that the documents are forgeries. There's the inquisitor's assumption, and they do. Full of dream, not dreams, but uh, allegories. Philo tried that in the first century uh, AD. And that the writers were guilty of false statements as to the time and place of the authors of the documents. We're revisiting this entire view of the documentary view of the Pentateuchal authorship to refresh and update our previously held views. Back to the prof, being utterly unable to substantiate these charges by direct evidence bearing on the second separate documents. These deniers of mosaic authorship resort to two expedients. They charge first that some of the documents containing numerous unnecessary repetitions, and that these repetitions are often incongruous. No, that's, I, I hear what the prof is saying, but as for the inquisitors, repetition was a way to teach importance. We do that in catechism. We repeat our catechism all the time. Not once, but a thousand times. Secondly, that the incongruities result from the fact that the document represents widely different periods of development in the history of Israel. Again, presumption. And then turned into a historical fact for the inquisitors. Now he's going to take up the issue of repetitions. Taking up these charges in order, it is admitted that there are numerous, numerous repetitions of laws bearing on the same subject. We're reading uh, Boyce's Criminal Law. Um, it's a classic in law schools. I took two years of law courses. Didn't want to become a lawyer. Did it in retirement. Did it for fun. Utterly enjoyed the law courses. Uh, enjoyed the clarity with which judicial opinions were striven for and accuracy. They're constantly repeating cases. Case law. Famous cases. Who's surprised that the lawyers repeat things? And Moses, a lawyer, repeating things and here and there. No surprise at all to bring it in from a new angle. But it is not denied that repetitions prove that Moses was not the author. Every great teacher repeats. <laughs> Every great reformer repeats. Witness Paul on the resurrection and salvation by faith. Well, this is academies. Nice stuff for a slam dunk. Witness Muhammad on the unity of God and the condemnation of unbelievers. The duality or multiplicity of authors cannot then be proven from the mere fact of repetitions. This guy's got a good brain. I always see a lot of logic coming out of old Princeton. They're clear thinkers. You know, he, I think Robert Dick Wilson's buried in a very unpretentious grave out in Pennsylvania, out toward the Pittsburgh area. His memory serves. I'd love to go in some future travels and stop by. And this his body that still rests in the grave, being united to Christ, as we say in the Catechism, until the resurrection. Nor can it be, back to the prof, can it be argued from the fact that the repetitions are exactly alike, nor from the fact that they differ. Nor can diversity of authorship be argued from the fact that similar events are recorded as having occurred in the life of the same or different persons. To be sure, the critics make much of their inability to account satisfactorily to themselves for many of the differences and even adduce their ignorance of reasons for them as if it were evidence against mosaic authorship. And that's true. The, the, the liberals have eaten themselves and Graf Velhausianism has collapsed. They finally ate their young.
and now they, they got guys up at Princeton saying I'm post liberal and post this, post that, post the other. You don't know which post they are, but there's a, they'll come up with a new post something. For example, he has a footnote here in the surah, surah of the Quran, which repeats over and over 114 times in the name of the merciful and gracious God. So is that therefore got 114 different authors by parody of reasoning? For example, take the laws with regard to the altar. Might not Moses, or at least Jehovah, have foreseen that it would serve several hundred years before the worship at the central sanctuary could be established, and that even after the union of the tribes might be disrupted, so that men like Elijah might not be able to go to the central altar to sacrifice even when they would? Could a god or a lawgiver who provided for a second Passover for those who could not attend the first and permitted a pair of turtle doves or even a handful of flour to be given by those who were too poor to present a kid, not be expected to authorize an altar for special purposes and circumstances? The prof is asking a question there. Incongruities. The second charge is that there are in the Pentateuch at least five principal documents. I always thought he, he, five. Maybe he's talking about this H document, the fifth. J, E, D, P, and then some postulate a fifth H. Representing different periods. J was what? Ninth. A, e was eighth. P was seventh, I think. And... J E D D was seventh, P was fifth centuries. All these guys, different centuries, descended on the book of the Pentateuch and rewrote it, re edited it. And that these differences of aim and time account for the alleged incongruities of the works attributed to Moses and exclude the possibility. Mosaic authorship. The charge is based upon the assumptions. We're back to that again. Presuppositions. Faith statements. A Deuteronomy D was written in or shortly before 621. Yeah, I said 7th century for D. That the real or alleged incongruities between the parts of the Pentateuch can be explained only by a wide difference of date in the time of their composition and a series of forgeries on the part of their authors. That is, the guy comes along in the seventh century and puts the words back into Moses' mouth and claims Moses as the author. We go back to Philo's comment. And Josephus is on the same sheet of music too. Philo says that his Jewish rabbis would rather die a thousand deaths than to alter a syllable of the Pentateuch. But, you know, what does a modern German liberal Lutheran in the 19th century care about that? Well, he should, unless he's just going to toss him too. For the assumption that Deuteronomy was written in or shortly before 621 BC, there is absolutely no direct evidence. The testimony of Deuteronomy itself is that it was given by Moses in the plains of Moab. The passage in 2 Kings 22:23 ascribes it to Moses. Josiah attributes the wrath of Jehovah to the fact that the and Josiah has, has a reformation about 622 BC to the fact that the fathers had not hearkened to the words of the book that had just been found and read before him. 22, 8 through 13. Huldah, the prophetess, represents Jehovah as saying, I will bring upon this place all the words of the book which the kings of Judah hath read. The elders of Ju Judah and Jerusalem and the king and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets and all the book 
both small and great, heard the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord, and covenanted to perform the words of the covenant, which were written in this book. 23, 1 through 3. Although the book of Deuteronomy contains laws affecting the king, 17, 14 and following, and the prophets, 18, 15 and following, and the priests, 18, 1 and following, and it must be admitted that the kings and prophets and priests had existed in unbroken succession from the time of Samuel, that's pre menarchial and in the, the, toward the close of the judges period, from the time of Samuel down to the time of Josiah. That would be, what, 300 plus years. And that the kings and prophets must have had the customary laws, regulations, yet no protest against the genuineness or authenticity of the newly discovered book was made by the king, prophet, or priest. All accepted the Pentateuch as authoritative, proceeded to carry out its injunctions into execution. 23, 1 to 25. Now, this is very important to recognize that in 621, the canon people, again, we discuss the canon, we're often standing around thinking that the church approved the canon, say, at the Council of Carthage in 397. There's a second one, 393, 393, 397, in that time window. And we're discussed in other videos the view, the Roman Catholic view on authority versus the true Catholic view. But that's for another day. My point here is that in just King Josiah's time, 621, they're looking backwards <clears throat> to the importance of the Mosaic legislation, without a doubt. Same with Jesus. Against this evidence of the documents themselves, the critics, uh, Maybe we get a new name for them. The presupposers, maybe that's, I, that's better. Inquisitors is pretty harsh. You call them inquisitors. But the uh, presupposers, liberal presupposers, make the charge that the writers of the sources for Second Chron Kings 22-23, that is the book of the Chronicles of the Kings, the composer of the books of Kings and Chronicles, and Hilkiah the high priest, Shaphan the prophet, Huldah the prophetess, and Jeremiah the prophet were either forgerers or dupes. Well, yeah, because the, those people all went back to Moses too. You got so you've got to implicate the whole crowd. It's unpleasant what these inquisitors, these presupposers do. I mean, it's pretty serious attack on the canon. The forgerers, duped, ignorant of Moses, deniers of, affirmers of Moses' authority and composition, but fools on a, on a bad errand. They're duped that Deuteronomy was not the work of Moses at all, but a composite work of an unknown author put together or promulgated for the purpose of deceiving the people into the acceptance of greater reform and worship. The kernel of this reform is affirmed by confining of the worship to the central sanctuary at Jerusalem. To be sure, the book of Deuteronomy says nothing expressly about Jerusalem we, why would we expect that in the 15th century? Hulda also does not mention it as the second or the central sanctuary. The king and the people, including prophets, priests, and scribes, do not specifically mention a central sanctuary in their covenant with Jehovah. But why would they? They'd already had it there. There's no need for the affirmation of that. They had the Solomonic Temple for 300 years. It was just a given. It was a datum. 
Jerusalem is not mentioned. It is true, and 2323 is the place where the Passover is held. But according to the Book of Kings, the temple at Jerusalem was to be the dwelling place of Jehovah in accordance with the promise made by God through Nathan to the prophet, 2 Samuel 7. Jeremiah, who prophesied in the days of Josiah, 300 years later, 300 plus years later, speaks not merely of the fact that Jehovah had chosen Jerusalem to put his name there, but also says that at first Shiloh had been the place where the Lord had set his name. Not merely in the Pentateuch, but also 30 times in Joshua, once in Judges, 60 times in Samuel, and 13 times in Kings. The Ark is named as the center of the worship of the people of God. When this Ark was removed to Jerusalem by David, and not till then, did the city become the place where men ought to worship. All through Joshua, Judges, up to Samuel, was at Shiloh. And there was one other place, too, for a bit. That's a long period of time. Finally, David comes to the throne, and he does all the preparatory, preliminary work for the building of the temple, but God has said, you're not building it because you've been a man of blood. And he lays the financial, fiscal grounds, supply, logistical grounds for his son Solomon to pick up and complete the work. And that becomes a great theme of First Kings, it's the establishment of the Solomonic Temple. Moreover, that Jerusalem was recognized in the time of Solomon is clear from the fact that one of the first acts of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, was to appoint Bethel and Dan as rival centers so as permanently to remove the people of Israel from the evil influence at Jerusalem. This was in the grand schism that occurred. Thus, neither for the general charge nor for their principal specification do the critics find any direct evidence in Deuteronomy or Kings, nor in any other Old Testament document. Jeremiah, whose genuineness they acknowledge, is silent as to the general charge, but absolutely clear in his evidence against the specification with regard to the time of the organization of the central sanctuary. Maybe I hate to end at the middle of of a paragraph, but our time has elapsed, and I'll have to call it an end here and pick up, hopefully, with an adequate summary so we can step back into it next time. Hymn 669, 17th century hymn. Commit thou, oh, hymn 669. Commit thou all that grieves thee and fills thy heart with care to him whose faithful mercy the skies above declare, who gives the wind their courses, who points the clouds their way, as he will guide thy footsteps and be thy staff and stay. Let us close with prayer. Almighty and ever living God, hear all of our prayers that we bring to you as tiny, puny, small human beings in your world. And that we may obtain those desires that we have, make us to ask those things only that are pleasing in your sight through the omnipotent person of Jesus, our sovereign savior, amen. Till next time, Godspeed.